Good evening. <laughs> Welcome to Rubber Duck Engineering. Hello, Adam. Hi, Eric. How are you? Uh, tonight on Rubber Duck Engineering, we are going to continue our quest through Rust and Ren, and we're going to add maps, uh, you know, like the dictionary things. Uh, not, not like the things with borders between countries? Uh, yeah, no no little dropping dots from your uh, panable, you know, whatever they call that view in Google Maps. But no, maps, like dictionary things. Because um, the Ren compiler thing, um, uh, it continues to, to move. Yeah, it's got, it's got um, legs. It's clearly going places with it. Oh, I, I am loving it. I am, I am loving this project. I am loving uh, playing with Rust. As I, I think I said last week, I feel like I'm atoning for decades of C++ sins. Um, but yeah. Um, oh, I had one thing I wanted to talk about. You, you said something uh, that was really eye-opening to me at the end of last week's show, right after we cut off air. Oh, I um, did? Yeah, you, you talked about how you enjoyed last week's show because you thought it was fun that we got to sort of um, see how engineering is done and sort of show the machine. You, you pointed out to me uh, one of the things that I think I sort of implicitly understood, but maybe hadn't, hadn't vocalized, um, which is that no one understands software projects. They're just too complicated to fit into anyone's head. Like, I don't understand all of Flutter. I never have, never will. Um, I'm sure the same was true of you when you worked on Flutter or, you know, for, for Fuchsia or your other projects. Um, I mean, there's a scale project that, that fits in your head, but it like you run out, right? Like, oh, uh, Frank sent us a message. Hi, Frank. Um, yes, we do have the code on GitHub. I will post the link very shortly. Um, but, to, but to close the point, um, what we do is we build machines and then we operate the machines. And I can show that some in the, in the code tonight. Um, yeah, it reminds me a little bit of like mountaineering. Like there's certain mountains you can climb just by climbing them with your, your hands and feet. And at some point you need tools to like assist you. And so like to me, the enterprise of software engineering is like, how do we climb this impossibly steep mountain that no human being can understand how to do how do we bring it down to the realm where a human being could actually do it? And, and the answer is you just have to build these systems that just help you. And I think this is the link yeah, in case that, that we're going to be using from, and it should be live and up to date. Um, but one of the things I think this ties into the imposter syndrome that is just everywhere. Like, I mean, I feel it. I think I'm sure you felt it. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes you imagine like, Oh, the senior engineer, like that person understands the whole thing. Yeah. But the, the truth is no, the senior engineer is just, just as a, much of a bumbling idiot as you are, right? Yeah. They just they just build a system that allows them to make progress in that scenario. Yeah. I mean, I, I can think of countless times where I've joined teams as a junior engineer. This was much earlier in my career. And like there was the senior engineer who like was the, the TL. I don't know if we called it that then, but like, and uh, and now I just understand. No, they didn't have it all in their head. They just knew how to turn the crank on the machine. I feel like, like when I'm evaluating code now, that's the way I look at it is like if somebody sends me a patch and it's got some really complicated invariant that like spans three different files yeah. and it's like there's an if here that lines up with a something else there. It's like, oh, I don't know, like like cl clearly like at the moment when we were writing this, we could understand this, but no way when we come, at, come back to this in a month or a week or a year or whatever, are we ever going to remember that the left hand and the right hand have to match each other? <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't prepared for the magic trick, Eric. <laughs> it's okay. Um, <laughs> anyways, and it distracted us from our from our conversation. We should probably move to the code machine. Although, if if we can if we can lecture, if we can rant for one more second, this also reminded me of why APIs are important. Um, mm. You said many of the. I mean, you and I've worked together for like over a decade now. But like um, another thing that I remember sort of learning is that like APIs are important because APIs set your tools. And you can only think, or you start to only think with like what is possible with your tools. And so like, as I've been building up this Ren thing, it's been important to like give thought to like, okay, what is the like API onto value going to be? I don't care how it's implemented. Like it's also about like limiting the complexity. Like I haven't done the garbage collector for Ren, but I don't care. Cause it's like buried behind an API. I think that's where like experience comes in is like if you can craft an API that you know that later you'll be able to put the garbage collector behind, then that yeah. gives you it sort of frees you to like work on other parts of it without having to solve that problem. So shall we to the code machine? Let's do it. 
Okay, uh, so this is the code. And oh, hi, Super Dev. Thanks for joining us. Uh, one second. Share my screen. And I'm sorry, I did not fully set up the code machine before we got going, but now we're here. All right. Okay. Hey, nice to see you, Servo Dev. Nice to see you, Frank. Um, so if I turn back off our banner, we can see the code. Uh, let us know if we need to make this bigger. We do have an embiggen button. Um, so I should show you a little bit of what's going on. I think when we last left our heroes, we had, what, maybe 100 tests working? I think 155, if I remember correctly. OK. Um, we now have, I think, like um, 270. Whoa, 270? 279, in fact. Wow, that's incredible. What so, was this like a big was this like a big step function or was all that all just like little individual ratchets? Um so many of them came at, at times that you the, the like finishing whatever, like the finishing move in Mortal Kombat or whatever. It's like finishing blow. <laughs> the finishing blow. There was so much setup, like all the hard patches are the, the so much setup, and then it's the victory lap things where you get like you do a one line change and you get 10 badges. I think a lot of them come came because uh, our stub, our stub Rencore is a lot more real now. Well, if it's a, it doesn't fit on one screen. <laughs> oh yeah. It, looked, it was just like the first six lines there. So what happens is that I've just started pasting in sections and then things that don't compile, I just comment out. Hmm. Um, and actually some of these, we, are, we probably now have the technology to compile some of these. Um, and so like it has sequence and sequence was a big, and then the fact that string and list and stuff now inherit from sequence. Sequence was necessary because I added lists. List was a big thing. I, if you recall the number one error last time in our common error files was this. It was like something related to this lookup. It was like expression missing or something, hit the left, left square bracket token. Um, and so now, you know, now fiber is the number one new fiber, um, which we're not going to solve tonight. Uh, but so is, is now, map on this list? Uh, oh. Map is on this list. This is actually probably map right here. Oh, I see. So the token is the left curly brace. Oh, that's like how you make a map little roll or whatever. So I, th I think we can do map tonight. I it, it'll be a it'll, it'll be a bit of work, but I think we can do it. Um, so just before the show. Um, in between dinner and the show, I managed to get um, fields working on. Um, I'm, I'm amazed you did all this without fields. Like to me, a field, a field in a class is like such a basic part of a programming language. I'm amazed anything works without it. Well, the way you cheat is that all these primitives uh, do their actual storage. All their fields are actually in C code. Oh, I see. And so they don't have like custom fields or like fields for user defined classes. Correct. Uh, and user defined classes, I, I don't remember whether we had those last week, but I added those. Um, another thing that I added, speaking of the machine, um, file.txt, any one of these examples. So now for every single, uh, every single test, when it runs, it dumps out, it basically does a dump of what, the compi of what it compiled. And why this is what, this what your, your program compiles, or this is what Ren C compiles? This is what my program compiles. Okay. I so actually like a ran disassembly of. What you say? This is like a disassembly of the the bytecode. Yeah. For uh, the neither Ren C or my program really have a, a bytecode per se, but yeah, the op stream. Um, but yes, it's a disassembly. And the reason why I did this is that because there's things like this pop. And if you have an extra one or not enough of one, and like you really want to see those differences and you want to be able to evaluate those differences across like a couple. And so what I did was I found myself reverting my change and then generating this, saving it in a file, and then basically diffing it with after my change and trying to understand what the heck I'd changed. Hmm. So But you don't know what the like golden, like uh, like the the what you're aiming for in those files. So you're just looking at the diffs each time you change something and Correct. making an evaluation about whether that seems like it's moving forward or seems like it's not moving forward. And I have to actually say that of the pieces of the machine that has not turned out to be a useful one, 
like it, it's been of a little bit of use, but it's not probably was worth the effort to add. Um. Anyway, so uh, we added. I feel like if you if you had if you had that for Ren C as a reference, that might be even more helpful, right? Because then you could tell like mm -hmm. when you're getting closer. Yeah, I, and I thought about doing that. Um, I did actually run Ren C once this week. Um, I was what was I? I was struggling with something. Oh, I was struggling with um, assignments. So whenever I would do an assignment, I would end with a, two copies of the thing on the stack. And mm -hmm. I was trying to understand why. Uh, and it turns out that there was just this misleading comment in the Ren C code, as well as I missed a return statement in the transliteration. And so I was both keeping the evaluated contents of the right-hand side on the stack, as well as issuing a store as though I had just done a load of that same uh, variable assignment. So anyways, I fixed it. Um, but but that, that, that sent me to Ren C, and I managed to get it compiled. Um, anyway, so maps depend on Ren, Ren core, not Ren. Hi, folks, we've got quite a few tonight. Um, so like a map sequence. See how they save these fields. Hmm. Um, but an actual map, let's see, class map. Yes. App is sequence. Um, oh, I see. The sequences let you tear off the keys and the values and such. Yeah, sequence is like the base class. It's like the iterator. It's like the base class for list um, and such. But this is the thing. Like in order to have actual entries in your map. I see. You need to have fields. You need to have fields. So I haven't actually tested the field support. <laughs> other than I, it, it passed a whole bunch of tests when I added it. Oh, the other thing that passed a whole bunch of tests because you'd asked that earlier was... Um, significantly teched up our macro support. So like, we just now have this giant pile of macros defined for uh, num. Like we have num binary op and num urinary op. U u urinary? U u unary. <laughs> unary. Uh, yeah, don't say that wrong, Eric. Um, and uh, yeah, I just defined a whole bunch. And that, you know, was like 20 tests there or something like that. So how do we get started on map? Like where, where is the entry point into that, that work? Uh, so what I would do is I would try and take this. Just try and copy this in to Stubbrain Core. And I put it in the same spot. I think it was right right ahead of range. range. I think it was right <laughs> Your mouse wheel is very loud, by the way. <laughs> Yeah, it is loud. It sounds like a cricket. <laughs> <laughs> I have this um, funny, like ergonomic mouse, and I really like the the old one that I had. Uh -huh. I got it from work. Oh, um, what a funny! Oh, is it, it like it's like a vertical one? Like you? It's like uh, a vertical mouse. Uh -huh. um, I got it because at various times, you know, my this bag of meat that I drive, you know, is is breaking down in various ways. Um, but uh, I got it some years ago, but I got the old one, which I actually still have on my desk, because if you ever saw my desk, it's a total disaster. Um, but the old one was like breaking a little bit. That's not I even should... vertical, that old one. Like, how, how could you use that? Oh, this one is vertical too. It's like the oh, old one, but the same thing. But, um, but the new one is worse. It's, it's, like, it's like all the, you know, the people, you know, Talking about back in the day, they made things better. Yeah, well, back in the day, this company made a better version of their mouse. Oh um, man, you've become a grumpy old man. I've become a grumpy old man. Um, so yeah, so you start by just splatting it in. Uh -huh. um, and I'm gonna have to find my terminal it's here. And then cargo, and you just pick a random thing. It doesn't matter which. And you look, and you find 583. Hold on. Oh, sorry. That's where it is in the VM. What line? Line 300. I see. It's, it's like trying to eat the new code and it's mad. Yeah. So the, the difficulty, one, there's one of the difficulties with debugging the stub rend core changes is that it's loaded up like secretly by the VM before mm -hmm. you ever really get. So I have a bunch of code to like disable it printing anything at you. Um, so and then you just comment out the failures. So like, what is this? Oh, yeah, one of the features that may actually block us from being able to do this is that I don't yet support um, forward declared classes. 
Oh, I see. So key map sequence is not declared yet because it's going to have a circular reference with map. Yeah. So we may. I'm actually not sure that it's. We actually probably could just move this up. Mm -hmm. In fact, we just we just literally do that. Yeah. So if we just move these three up, what did I do? Did I do it wrong? So this is not like how I want to stand up. Like I want to stand up with a perfect same copy. Mm -hmm. That might just go faster. So now this entire thing now combines. Hmm. If we if we got to here, then um, then we got uh, maybe. Uh, I think so. I think if we got here, then then it compiled. So then you just like rerun the test to see if this. Or do we have to somehow wire up the syntax for a map to? Oh yeah. So this didn't this didn't wire up the like. The map operator or anything, but I actually suspect that that splatting in there probably passed a bunch of tests for us. As I said, I, I never tried that um, because the, again, the hard work, the thing that I you know, you know, spend spend the long time doing is all these like routing patches. You you just it's like a cooking show, you know, when you come to Rubber Duck Engineering on Thursdays. In your in your other oven, you cook fields. <laughs> Check it out when it's. I mean, personally, I find it. Um, a little hard to do some of the like really deep coding that is necessary for this while I'm talking about it. But um, I know a lot of, a lot of artists might... who are on Twitch have a similar kind of feel where they have trouble like doing doing the, like the hard part of art while people are, are tuned in. So I think where were we before this? Two hundred and fifty or something like that. Um, I think it's at two seventy nine. Oh, well, then maybe we didn't pass any tests. Let's see. So it looks like we got rid of undeclared variables. Uh, we somehow tried to talk to a string instead of a class at some point. Got rid of undeclared variables. And we don't have a new method on map. That might be the next thing to work out. But with map now existing, I suspect we can uh, do the thing. Like if we go to, so, so we can see. Uh, so here's our change in the stubborn core. You see map new now compiles. It doesn't run, but it compiles. And similarly map entry. So these look like progressions. They're not all the way to pass, but at least they're. This one's a little concerning. I was surprised that it would be trying to. This would suggest I probably did field. There's probably a bug with fields. So we may not actually be able to get maps working tonight unless we fix it. Class subclass do not inherit from built-in class map. I've got none. Oh, this is the they're expected. Oh, interesting. And yet some of this passed. Okay, that's fine. So yeah, this is a progression. Um, add map to stub ren core. Got red. So and then I think we got to like turn the machine as we were talking about earlier. Um, we now would just go here, and I I think we can make progress on this. I think if we go looking for. So you now we find like an example test that has this error. Yep. And if there isn't a simple simple enough one, we can just write one. But like so, let's what's. What is this thing? Map contains key. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, I don't know if that's the simplest one, but like, we could go look and see what. Um, so the issue is that we can't parse the first line where it has the curly brace to create the map. Yeah. So uh, we should just implement map literals. It's a bit of work, but like, I think this is doable in in our time. So shall we do it? Let's do it. Um, so the first thing is probably to teach, you guys are going to get a tour of the code. Um, the thing that, that it's, it's barfing on is that you need a grammar rule. Um, so this grammar rule, mm -hmm. with the left curly brace is wrong right here. 
I left myself a Let's comment. See. So we can do this, but this won't compile because map won't be defined. I think I defined it already. Maybe I really baked this in a different oven. No. And so then what we do here is instead we go to compiler, we just go to the original. Where it was in the files, so we can put it in similar spots right after list. And I didn't used to do this. I used to just like type them from scratch, but I just realized that <laughs> I need to convert the whole thing to Rust and then refactor the world. <laughs> Trying to convert as I go is not working. But I think I said it was after list, more or less. So we just splat it in. And start transliterating into, into Rust. Well, I've gotten pretty good at this. Okay. I know all the things that I'm going to do wrong. Like if you leave that second semicolon, Rust will give you terrible errors <laughs> and get super confused for a long time. Um, so this is just load core variable. So what this does is it looks up a variable by name. So this gives you the map class basically. And pushes it on the stack. So that's why we had to do the thing in Rencores to make that thing exist so we could grab it here. Yeah, that's the first step. You gotta like uh, declare. And then call method. Same thing. So, so, so load cover about that's basically emitting opcodes and put that on the stack. I see. And what this call method is doing is this is again emitting an opcode that says call. And the Ren C opcodes for this are super crazy. They have, they use like, I don't know, 30 opcodes for calls and stuff like that. Not, not that they emit 30 of them, they just have a variety of, we just have one call opcode. It's just an that just carries the, the, like, this is what I want you to call, please. I see. Yeah. Um, so there's that. And now our stack contains a newly instantiated map. Correct. Okay. An, uh, an object, uh, an object instance. An object instance of map. Okay, that makes so sense. Object instance is a new thing. When you last, when you last saw our heroes, like we only knew how to make numbers and and range. This was actually something that was causing me a bunch of anxiety because I didn't know how to do the like generic object. Mm -hmm. But it turns out generic objects are just a very specific, like from from C plus plus perspective, it's just like a a class with a vector of fields. Mm -hmm. I see. You just do this loop and ignore new lines. So now we're now we're moving through the syntax of the source file. It's sort of interesting how you intermix like manipulating the runtime stack in some sense in some static way, and then also manipulating the syntax of the input file. Like like load yes. core variables, the thing that's going to happen at runtime, but ignore new lines, the thing that's happening sort of now at compile time. Yes. Well, that's one of the things you pointed out is that one of the weird things about Ren is that this Ren compiler, the one that we're transliterating, is that it um, it skips a bunch of steps in doing it's a like, compiler. So, right, so you're not like constructing an AST that you'll later walk to go generate the code from. You're just like generating the code as you're tokenizing. <laughs> Correct. Which is kind of cool. Like it's, it's neat that you can design a language that way. Um, so this is just- So give, give, give you asked a question here. Oh, say, hey folks, have you tried Google's filament project? It's really great if Flutter integrates with filament, provides first class first for 3D renderings. That I looked into filament uh, actually a little while ago. It looked really cool. Like some of the some of the like visual demos are like super impressive. Um, I actually tried um, downloading it and building it, and I got it to run, um, but the demos on my machine didn't look good. I think I didn't have like a I didn't have like the white right graphics setup or something. But um, yeah, it's super cool. Yeah, we know um, we know the author, uh, or like the original author, um, and we've talked with him about it some. But I, there's been no active work on that in years, uh, not on filament itself, just on and making the two play nicer together. Um, but it could be cool. Um, so we just continue transliterating this. We're mostly just uh, this is I think peak peak expecting in my world instead of peak. Uh, and all of these were like conscious choices. Like the, the way that uh, Ren C does is, is you can call peak on the compiler because that's their context object, whereas we have an explicit context object. Uh, and then it returns a token, but our tokens are like meaty. 
in um, Rust that can have stuff in them. So you don't return it, instead you pass in. And this only so this works for- actually, This doesn't actually consume it, right? This just says, if that's what's gonna happen next, then I'm out. Correct, as opposed to consume expecting or match expecting. Match and consume are different. Consume it like it eats it, and then if it wasn't it, it bails, whereas match it checks to see if it is that, and then if it is that, it eats it, and it returns you the bool. Um, and peak just looks. Okay. Um, parse presence, this is the base of the, of the, the fancy parser uh, system. Well, the, what was it called, the Pratt parser? You remember in a couple episodes ago, we were like building the, the basics of the Pratt parser. It's kind of neat to see it all teched up. And now you can just like call it with these very high level instructions and it's like machinating its internal machine to do this stuff. Uh, so one of the things I'm also, I finally gave in and I'm like moving to their string message system, their string error messages. So I now have this consume expecting message. It will eventually replace consume expecting, but it just lets me splat out these error codes. I can like fix them at time of, of transliteration as opposed to going back and finding each of the 300 call sites with different error codes or different error messages that the tests look for, right? Your new lines, CTX. Anyways, as I said, I, I started not doing this. I started not like changing how this was all structured as I went. And I just, I eventually gave up. I just couldn't do it. Couldn't keep it in my head. So expression, this is gonna like parse a expression, evaluate it and put the result on the stack? That's correct. Okay. Uh, so another thing that the REN- like, It's like hybrid token, tokenization, like code generation execution thing is so, it's neat. Like I, I, I've never worked with a system like this. Uh, another thing that it does is the RENC code has per op type, I think, an expectation of stack change. So it can do some validation about like how the stack actually ended up changing. So when you say parse precedence unary, does that also leave the evaluated value on the stack? Um, parse precedence just starts a uh, uh, the parse tree at a given. Um, uh, I guess I'm asking, my my question is so here here you're saying call, call method add core. It looks like it takes two arguments. And so I, I see where the second argument is coming from. It's coming from line 12, 12. I'm curious where the first argument is coming from. Uh, from that parse precedence. But you I don't see. really know what all the parse precedence is gonna do. It could do different things depending on. But its contract is after it's done, the stack has one more thing on it, which is whatever the result of all that was. I think so. Because I think it is the, I think it calls expression. We can go look, it's very easy to come back. So parse precedence first looks for something with a prefix. So it like always expects that there should be a prefix parser for whatever it's called from. A prefix is like a, a left parenthesis or whatever. Uh, no, it's like, it could be a name, but just like a token that by itself, you, you know what something to do with this specific token I as see. opposed to like an infix parser or something that's more complicated. It's like a way to anchor the parse parse. It's like, okay, let's first look at all the things that we can think about from looking just from the left hand side. I see. And then once you have that anchor, you then go, oh, okay, what are the things that we can now anchor off of that? Uh, so we do the prefix parser, and then we go and consume for any further tokens, any infix related rules from that. And these are all looked up. These are these grammar rules. This is the Pratt parser. It's, it's the base of the, of the right. So and this is like where we add, added this, uh, the map thing. Yeah. So like, for example, the prefix one is like, if you see a left token, that's a, that's a, like a prefix rule. We're going to like now start into the map mode. I see. Um, but whereas if you look at like the plus sign, uh, like this is an infix truck. If, if, if you just like are leading with a plus sign, we just don't know what to do. Like that's not a valid way to start an expression. I see. Okay. Another nice thing about- very, very delicate dance to get all this stuff to like exactly work. Yes. And, and that's why trying to change it on the fly was so 
Um, uh, that's correct. Romaine Guy uh, wrote, uh, I, I believe, started the filament project. Or Roman. Did you correct my pronunciation? I, I, I think that's the correct way of pronouncing it. Maybe, maybe I'm pronouncing it wrong. I, I suspect you're right. Um, I, I definitely don't think it's Romaine. I've never heard him say it that way. Let's see. Um, so match is a keyword in Rust. This will also get you. Rust will see this, get super confused. But the syntax highlighter will be like, oh, that's a method. Yeah, totally. You're fine. <laughs> it's like yellow, not purple. But like the compiler is like, I, you know, like, um, so this actually needs to be match current. Dx token. Uh, and like while it's not like a trailing while for like do while is not a So this has to be a if not and I also have most of the primitives now. This is a new lines, PX. This is gonna consume expecting message. I think this is why we peaked it before is because we were just going to jump down here and actually consume it. Um, yes. Right. Right curly brace. The REN code uses right brace and right bracket. And that is not enough context for my brain to distinguish those two. <laughs> so curly and code. square. <laughs> I had to. It's the mustache or the uh, handlebar or the, the mustache and handlebar. I think are the same thing. And so that's it. Like we just transliterated another Rust function. So did we actually implement the new method, or is that something we also have to implement? That is something we we just got rid of that parse error. Is what we did. So we made it so that the. Okay. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a runtime error now that's going to say, oh, I called this new method on this thing that doesn't exist. Yeah, it'll, it'll barf about add core being missing or something like that. Mm -hmm. right, so assuming that we wired it up and the Rust compiler thought we were fine. So, But yes, when this goes, maybe another test will pass. Um, but, but otherwise, the test will fail, but in a different way. Correct. We, that big block of, like, if we go back and look at it, the common test errors, like, this big block will be gone. It will no longer be 61 things. I see. That's It'll be out until the last Yeah. Okay. And probably 40 of them will be the missing ad core. Like, well, maybe all 61 of them actually will be ad core, because ad core is just, like, <laughs> the way it builds up the map. Um, the ad core is funny. Um, there, there clearly was a lot of effort to optimize Ren C. And so there's this add core also for building lists, which is only used by the by the compiler. And basically all it does is it makes it so that the add function, which normally would return the thing added, instead returns the map. Mm. And all it's trying to do is on the stack. Correct. So then it's you know it's one or it's a couple fewer operations to add the next one. Pass three more tests. Let's have a look. Yeah, so like this is gone now, right? Yeah. We have two more waiting for the, the fiber new. I see 58 of them got replaced with the new, and three of them succeeded. Yeah, and they may be succeeding due to, like, now they're hitting a different parser or something like this. So EUF after value. Oh, this was just a, a grammar check. It's like, can you have an end of file at the end of the value? Yes, we presumably do the right parse behavior because we literally translate the, the, the parser. Same thing here. That's what the, the, the red ones here. I don't know if you can see that on stream, but these, these are deleting the expectation file. Suggest it. Which means which totally pass. If we look at passes, we'll see that. So. Um, More progressions. Success. Parsing for map literals. I'm really impressed. That, like, we're actually going to do it. We're, we're totally going to have maps working by the end of this, this show. Uh, I don't know. We're going to hold you to that one, Eric. <laughs> um, yeah, just grammar works for now, but that was enough to pass three more tests. 
So it's presumably, we have to define some sort of um, like native backing for this map class that's actually going to hold all of the keys and values. Right? Oh, yes. Okay, that'll take a few more minutes. It, it, it's not that hard. It just it's going to be some typing. Uh, will, will it? I, I suspect if we go and look. So we look at. Um, Is you, you're going to you're going to back it with like a Rust hash map or something or? Probably. Um, we oh I see we were missing that. Okay, so if we look at map new, you're, you're now suggesting to me that we may not actually get. So ran new map. We're looking at the C code now. So yes, obj map. So we have to implement obj map, which won't be hard. Let's see what it does. We just use like um, the Rust hash map, probably, right? Probably. Let's see. Number of capacity count and and the entries. I see. All right. So it is just doing a vector of map entries. All right, that's simple. Oh, we could use, we, I guess my default would be to just try this and see where it gets us. I don't know if it's actually gonna do any hashing or if it's just doing linear lookup. It said hash in the comment at least. Let's say, use oh. linear probing. Addressing linear probing, yeah. I mean, I feel yeah. like we just keep keep following our notes, right? Keep keep now we need to implement a new method and just like. Well, just I, I think you're right. We're, we just should just use the um, the hash map from Rust. That'll be simpler. Well, we can look, um, but yes. So following to follow our notes, we would go to our ren core, which is core of this thing, and. We would do something like we did for list. I don't know what order it's supposed to be in, but it doesn't matter. We can fix it later. So we do map. Map. Map new. Seems legit. So let's do this new. Yep, it's going to be the same kind of thing. New. I've always wanted the compiler to be able to like reorganize my source code. Be like, okay, I yes. want all of my implementations in my C implementation file to match the order that I put them in the header. Like, yeah. I, I think I may have said this on stream before, but I think we could go further. Like, why is it that we, why do we worry so much about uh, the format that we check in? Why don't we project whatever format people are most comfortable reading? Some people do that with the like white space, where they'll, they'll change the white space to tabs or spaces or whatever in in their editor. But like I, I wanted to like reorganize the source code too. All right, so this thing we're just doing ren new map. You literally just you just follow the compiler. Um, map. Yeah. We'll go stick that in there in just a second. And then I don't actually know what we're going to put in it yet. Let's map. And go back to. Uh, did I do this? I thought you did. Maybe you didn't. Guess not. Huh. What did I do? Did I like copy the list one? And then didn't. Oh. Oh, map new versus new map. <laughs> okay. I mean, that makes some sense. Like, type it wrong? Do you want to fix the list one to match? Uh, it's, it's well, right. We're going to go down in the weeds here. Um, but. Let's see what Ren calls them. Ren core. Ren new map. So I just typed it wrong in that other one. 
Okay, great. I'm so used, so used to Fuchsia. So Fuchsia is always like uh, library tag object verb, which would be ren uh, map new. Hmm. This, there's just so much boilerplate. This is what's going to slow us down. You can go and make it crazy, but it's also sort of nice just to have the code after you type it out. Well, you and I could talk later about how to structure this better. You had talked about having a subtype here, or like typed object. Yeah, get it like a trait or something. But, uh, that's not, I don't think we could structure that here. We're not going to do that now. Um, click on this. Core classes. This is this little cache, this like lookup cache, basically, which you could argue whether I need it. Um, it just gets filled. Oh, are you sure that was correct? That last thing you just typed? Because all, all the rest of them are object class. Oh, I did this one. I did the list one too. Okay, and then we gotta teach this thing. So there is an object trait, by the way. Object is a trait. That's how we get the class off of it. That's all we we've, just, we've exploded all these into different um, value enum elements. Right here. This is the like one place that we use. The oh no, uh, we don't even. Uh, yeah, because this is uh, this could get cleaned up, but that's like either a whole episode or like you and I need to talk offline. Um. So here's this trait. I see you have to implement this trait for the map. Trait um, for list right here. I don't know if like this is followable at all. I know I'm just zipping around this source base. It makes sense to me. Like I'm, uh, I'm not familiar with it, this part of it at all. So. I think what we do did will compile and actually probably make some tests pass, but like the resulting thing. Well, I think we should keep going. Like we need to put some kind of data structure inside of the. Okay, we can also checkpoint here. Mm. Um, but yes, we do need to like like change change the errors that get produced. If nothing else. Uh, this will change the errors. They will now all fail with, you know, next missing method, because they they won't actually be able to do anything with that. Other than grab it. We'll try to add core, right? And add core won't be there. Correct. So add core is probably the next thing we do. This is uh, my favorite way of working, where you do these little tiny changes. And it's actually when I have to get like super lost in the weeds to go do the giant thing. That's that's the real struggle. This. I feel like part of it also is the code review tool. Like I've, I've used, started using Garrett uh, in recent years. And Garrett lets you just upload it like an entire stack of patches where each one is like a little tiny increment. And it's so much easier to review because like each of these things that you're committing is very yeah. self-contained. Like, oh, yeah, that's correct. That's correct. Yep. I see the test. Yep. 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 Whereas when you get a giant thing, it's like, ah, I don't know what it does. Yeah. So yeah. now we change them all to add core. And oh, yeah, all of them actually. It looks like 20 of them or so exploded into different things. Well, some of them were probably empty maps. Which don't call add core. Okay. All right. Here's a like a setter. Contains key. And we passed a test because yes, the type is defined because it inherits from object, and we did implement the class part. So, um, what do what do we call this? We did um, uh, basic. Implementation of map.new. Doesn't actually do anything. Giffy is trying to throw you off course by uh, by asking about your Raspberry Pi, but I, I think we'll hold that to the end of the episode. Um, Tim? <laughs> And so how do we do add core? Like, is that, do we define, do we register that like in the same sort of place here? What do you mean? Oh yeah, same thing. Uh, so we can copy pasta, right? We can look at this thing. Oh, list doesn't add core, I see. Yeah, 
So you can see primitive static knows how to grab the map and then like grab its super uh, its meta class and then define it on that, which is a, another macro added. I'm I, I'm so much better at macros this week than I was last week. I'm just infinitely better at Rust than I was three weeks ago. Map add core. So I'm going to do list add core. Or so this is where we we'll probably actually go look and see what the grand core does. Map and core. Yeah, this looks. I mean, looks pretty straightforward. Can I validate the key somehow? That's fine. Oh, I get to keep the comment. App and core. Okay, so validate key. What does validate key do? Presumably only certain kinds of objects can be keys in maps. Map is valid key. Fascinating. Okay, that's not hard to do. We just have to do it. Um, add that in. I think you're you may be sensing a pattern. Copy the C into the Rust. It just it gives you something to work from too. All right, so this is. You don't always actually make them. So we don't have these like his bool stuff. We need to write them. That could be a problem. Uh, Isn't it just like a match? Like you're matching on the type of the value? Oh, totally. Oh, I love it. And you're, you're sensing how I love Rust. Well, I feel like match is like the core of Rust. Like they clearly designed the whole system around making match amazing. Because match does like everything. Like Oh, and it's so much more powerful than like either you or I. I know. I, I feel like I, every time I touch map a match, I learn some new crazy trick you can do with it. And like I seen in some code review where I had like a match and an if. They're like, no, no, no. You can put the if inside your match. And I was like, really? And it worked. I was like, oh, okay. That's kind of awesome. And a little scary. I mean, it, it ended up reading nicely. Like it was like match this if that. Like oh yeah, the matches are beautiful. Range string. That's it. Oh my god, that was so glorious. Good old underbar. Got a little underbar. Okay. More commas. We demand the Vespian commas. So the analyzer or whatever does like add and remove commas sometimes for you, but clearly not those ones. Also, um, it's very rusty to not ever write return. Oh yeah, they, they, they repeat that out of me in code review too. They're like, okay, just end your function with the value. It'll be cool. And I'm like, but I have to squint and see if it has a semicolon or not, whatever. On a key, this is bool. Don't consume it, please. I want oh, it to mute. What is that? I can edit. I'm going to edit from my screen just to mess you up. Go do it. I'm doing the party. And we did it. We oh. did it if you forget that FN, you also <laughs> send the. Like, the compiler just had a wild goose chase. Oh my of, God. Like, yes. Bananas errors. There are just a few types, because I've tried them all, right? There's just a few types of errors that you do, and you will. If you just really... trace the C code into your Rust, it just puts <laughs> the Rust compiler into, into banana land. Like, are you saying they didn't design for that use case? When map is valid key, do you, you got to have the same right? case. Do you use the prefixes or a lot, or do you? Like, I'm curious about the like ren underscore prefix. Like, 
When do you when do you put oh, the ren prefix on? The ren underscore prefix I think means it's a it's like a, a their C API. Oh, I see. So this actually needs to be a result. Cool. And this needs to then be. See, this is like where they beat the the, the return. Beat, beat the returns out of you. So I don't have a like generic runtime error, but I, I should I should just do runtime error generic. I don't need to add my 85th runtime error type. Well, I don't know what your beef is, other than that I have to find that. I need to borrow this arg. No problem. Boom. I, I'm going to go define this thing. We'll we'll make it beautiful and all later, but like we could we could spend a lot of time fussing with the errors. This could be into. Okay. If not return false, that means throw. So this is uh, just update key. And then this is going to be, uh, so what this is going to be is this is going to be uh, let map equals args zero dot try into map, which will go implement, won't be hard. You can tell me that's such a terrible pattern. And then you know, map dot, uh, what's it? I mean, the Rust version is insert, but you don't have a hash map yet. Well, what are we going to call this thing? Data or something? Insert? Yep. And are we, is the value going to be a, a valid type for the key? Yeah, why not? Are we going to clone them? Does the map own the values? It must. Uh, in Rust, it usually owns the values. So can, can you take ownership of them out of this vector? Uh, it, I could pop them, yes. So I could I could do it that way, right? So I do let key. So what's the value equal args.pop? Uh, let um, key equal args.pop. And then it's going to be. So the, the way that I've done it for now is that we're not responsible for, I mean, you aren't in Ren C either, but like the, yeah, exactly. Key and then value. Yep. I don't know if data is the right name, but. Like kind of like inner, like uh, or impl or something. Sure, uh, impl is a terrible name too, but yeah. Um, so this would be value map. We have a few things to type out, but this should then work. I don't know if those at home are following along or if we're like in the crazy weeds. Uh, maybe, since, uh, maybe you don't need to pass the VM to validate key. Different mutability. Oh, really? Uh, you Is don't need it? a mutable uh, VM over here. Oh, yeah, I guess we, it's not mutable. I just thought we were passing around the mutable. I guess not. All right, so try into map. This is going to be in VM. Try into so I would love to have a conversation with you sometime about how to do this better because this seems crazy to me. I feel like you have a lot of boilerplate for your different types of values. I bet you could make them pretty generic. Oh my god! Oh, yeah, like the, you're getting a lot of scale here on different types, which it seems like you haven't uh, anticipated yet. Yeah, I mean, some of this is also my programming style is that like I pick up a, a, a way to do things and then I just like chase that until it just, until it bothers me so much I go from fix it. And this is one of those like, the runtime error thing is a, a thing that's bothering me and near the top of my list of things. 
but like I have to go here. Like these are not actually even that useful of a type. And this should just be a wrong gets, type. Is the purpose of this letter gets us like a fancy stringification? It doesn't get a fancy stringification. Like I, <laughs> yeah, I was just trying to be rusty when I did it and yeah, this is another part of Rust I don't fully understand is a lot of libraries I use have very elaborate error types. And I don't know, at least the Rust program that I'm I'm writing doesn't really want that. It just wants like an enum for like, you know, you got error negative 12. Hash map? Mm -hmm. Are you value? Yeah. I suspect we're going to have to like derive some traits for value to make this work. OK, that's fine. Um. Oh, yeah. Object map. Also, your little tip with handle is great. Handle is, you have to define it in every file because the type maps don't. But it's so nice to just be able to type handle. Right, data, I'm sure, is not public. Is that what you're, you're barfing about? Uh, pub crate. Um, missing field data. Oh, in initializer. Find uh, map. This thing. Yeah. Build resolve. Undeclared type. You said the import is in collection, SCD collection, hash map. A collections. Okay, can do. Wow, you import like nothing. That's incredible. Uh, the, I mean, Ren C is explicitly designed this way. Like, it imports really nothing. In fact, Ren C has a mode. I, I, I learned when I Ren C. There's a whole bunch beyond just the compiler. Like, all this integration with all these. But they have a mode where they will take the entire thing and turn it into one .c file. So, like, ease your uh, build integration. So you just use 1.c file and 1.h file, and you get all of ran. OK, no field data. Uh, that's because you need to borrow it. What? Insert exists, but traits bounds are not satisfied. Right, so you're going to implement those two, eq and hash. You just derive them for your, your, um, your OK. And we're scaring me a little bit here. You also need partial EQ because that's how EQ rolls. Oh, uh, we you have. Had, um, you had, right. had EQ already? Yeah, I had. I did partial EQ. Okay. Expected. I think he was going to say, OK. I wish there was like a quick fix to just wrap it in OK. <laughs> Where's my light bulb? Yeah. I, I the, the editor integration for Rust could be way, way better. Trade bound. EQ is oh, don't, don't, you don't derive EQ. You should just implement EQ. OK. Because it's, it's up, yeah. I'm going to want something like this. No, 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 you just implement it. It's like a sentinel. Like you, You've already implemented oh. partial EQ. You just have to tell it, actually, this is a total equality, not a partial equality. Oh, fascinating. Can I put a colon here? Well, I don't know. Can you? I don't know. Well, we got 571 problems right now. So. Uh, hash, hash. OK. Oh, I see. Hmm. <laughs> uh, I don't think uh, with, with 13 seconds remaining, I don't believe we're going to make it. OK, so we have to derive the hash trait somehow. Or we can implement the hash trait, but that's going to so, be some work. I think we should take a breath Yeah. and compliment ourselves on having gotten really close. We, we made a lot of progress, right? So what, let's review what we did. So we uh, 
added it to the Rencore file, which declared the types and declared a bunch of mm -hmm. uh, interface uh, for them. I got, got got their meta classes and stuff instantiated in the VM. We did the grammar to parse the uh, map literals, which generated the op streams to instantiate the objects. Then we implemented the constructor uh, method. So now we can construct hash maps. And then we implemented the um, thing that adds entries to the hash map. We just didn't quite succeed in satisfying the bounds for our native implementation. So we could just go through and like do uh, by hand implementation, but it's probably easier to just implement the hash trait for the values, and then then we should have a working hash. Or I don't think you can implement process. traits for values that are not declared in your in your uh, crate. But well, so I, I think we we're going to be forced to write our own hash, but that's fine. Hey, mm -hmm. We'll do this off screen before you before we'll, you we'll make it in the, in the off screen oven. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I we, yeah. all sorts of interesting ways we can take this. Um, but maps will be done when you when you come back next week, because um, we're close. Cool. But I was impressed how far we got. Yeah, I was. It was interesting to sort of see that, like, I, when we were doing it before, we were looking at very vertical slices. This is a very horizontal slice. Like we touched one bit from each layer to do this horizontal oh, yeah. feature through through the system. I thought it was quite interesting. Um, so we were going to try a new segment this week in our overtime here, but you were going to tell us uh, something you learned this week. Ah, yes. I actually left the house this week, which was a big step for me. I went to the Very dentist. You, <laughs> you, you went to the dentist? I have been slacking on going to the dentist because I've been afraid of the, the pandemic. But the case rate finally got low enough and like the vaccination rate got high enough. I was like, okay, I can try going to the dentist. And so I, I booked the dental appointment as the very first uh, time slot that they had available. And I showed up there like before anybody was there. And there was this random guy there delivering donuts. And he, he left donuts on the like doorstep of the, the dentist office. And it was like, when the receptionist gets here, tell her it was, the donuts are from Josh. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> like, is this like some kind of like romance going on here? Or, like, I, I didn't really understand the context of what was going on. Uh, but anyway, uh, eventually the like hygienist or whatever showed up, and the, the receptionist never showed up, so I never got to deliver the message. <laughs> but I did manage to get my teeth cleaned, which which was uh, I think probably good for me. That's impressive. My wife uh, told me that you know she had to wait like three months or something like that. She signed up to her dental appointment three months ago, and it's now finally going to be in a couple of weeks. Um, uh, I think my dentist must not have a lot of business because they were. I, I called them up. I was like, I'd like to come in for a cleaning. They're like, Cool. How about Monday? I was like, <laughs> okay. And like, how early can you, like, how about 8 a.m.? I'm like, yes. Well, clearly we should, we should try yours. Um, yeah, I was supposed to have something new and I've totally forgotten what it was I was going to say. But I did, um, as, as Giffy was asking, um, we have the pie. I have played more with it. Um, I think it would be cool to have a pie episode. I'd have to figure out, like, if we can get the pie on screen or like, Maybe like some camera setup and stuff for that. So stay tuned. Um, we also may have a few random episodes. We were also brainstorming in the, and we're way over time, so we can cover this all later. But we've talked about bringing on some guests. So stay mm -hmm. tuned. We might have some guests soon. So anyways, it was wonderful to see you, Adam. Wonderful to yeah. see all of you. Yeah, so thanks much. for having you in. That was really great. So uh, we'll see you all next week. See you. Thanks, Kiffy. <laughs>